Hey guys, it's Mark with Gables on the Go, and uh, I was having lunch today with my buddy Captain Joel Brandenburg here at Castaway Restaurant at Marathon. If you're new to charter fishing and you've ever wondered answers to questions that you're probably not going to find on YouTube many places, uh, we're not going to talk about fishing and what's biting and that kind of thing. We're going to talk about what you can expect if you're new to charter fishing, questions you may have about it, and maybe something that'll help you. Uh, when you're planning your vacation down here to the Florida Keys and Joel is going to be candid with us and answer some kind of tough questions that maybe captains don't always want to talk about. <laughs> so anyway, uh, stick with us in this video. Maybe you'll learn a thing or two. Maybe it'll make your vacation and your charter fishing plans in the Florida Keys that much better. So guys, this is my friend Captain Joel Brandenburg with Anna Banana Charters here in Marathon, Florida. And uh, I wanted to introduce you guys to Joel, let him tell you a little bit about him, his background. Joel, tell us about you. Well, uh, born in uh, Coral Gables, Florida. Uh, fished the Keys since I was a baby. Uh, Grandpa John was a captain down here for 40 years. Had the same boat called the Flamingo Bell. Uh, I've been fishing uh, the, the Keys as a full-time guide for about six years now and moved here from Tampa Bay where I was a full-time guide for close to 20 years and uh, I fish 300 days a year so I can afford to hunt the other 65. <laughs> and you, you do love that hunt and I tell you what. <laughs> yeah. You get after it. Yeah we just just got done with hunting season so now we're back to the fishing grind and the fishing's good and the once once the snow starts falling up north the phone starts ringing down here so we start getting booked up with charters but i'm proud of uh of our family heritage here in the florida keys especially with my son captain jojo who has been my first mate since he was five years old and now he's 25 so he's been a full-time master captain since he was 18 and he does the same thing i do uh fish almost every day of the year and we just love what we do. We wake up every morning mad as heck at the fish. <laughs> I tell you what, I got to go fishing with JoJo for the first time. I know we've been out a couple times just goofing around, but we actually got to go take a charter with JoJo not long ago. You guys can look back through our uh, videos and see the trip we took with JoJo, but uh, had a ball. He's going to be a good one. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm real proud of him. Sure. He, he makes sure that people knows that, know that he works uh, with me and not for me. So he wants to be his own man. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, hey, I wanted to ask you some questions, not so much about what whether the fish are biting or not, uh, what's biting or anything like that. I want to ask you some questions that maybe anybody watching this video might be afraid to ask a, a charter boat captain. The off the off subject stuff. I wanted to see what you say about that. So, one of the first things I wanted to ask you was, why is it so damn expensive? Why well, is it so expensive to go charter fishing, Joe? <laughs> I do get asked that, that question a lot. A lot of times when people pick up the phone or get on the internet and they're shopping around for a captain and they see the prices, yeah. uh, they're sticker shocked. Oh, yeah? And uh, a lot of times we do have to explain to them what goes into it and why it's so expensive just to take somebody fishing. And, you know, there's there's dock slip fees that are very expensive down here in the Keys. Uh, they charge by the foot. It's typically uh, $20 a foot to all the way up to maybe $70 a foot, depending on what marina you're at. And fuel prices are expensive here. Insurance. What's diesel running right now at the, at the dock? Well, I live at Poncho's Fuel Dock, a block away from Castaway here, and I saw them put up their diesel price sign today and it came in at 492 which is pretty fair compared to what it's been lately mm -hmm. so you can expect around five dollars maybe a little bit more most of the time so let's say you and i book you for a trip we're going to run out to the marathon hump with that 30 miles roughly out yes. there yeah 30 miles out 30 miles back plus all the running around how much fuel in a day would you say you typically burn on a trip like that so uh on our 50-foot Bertram and our 53-foot Hatteras, uh, we'll typically burn about 50 gallons of diesel an hour. Um, so on an eight to 10-hour trip, you can figure three, 400 gallons of diesel 
at five bucks a gallon. Yeah. So for us to run a, a humps trip and do all the running around that we do with trolling around there and everything else, you figure 90, 100 miles all together. And uh, no, wait we, a minute. Did you say 50 gallons per hour? 50 gallons per hour is typically what we'll burn. That's 250 bucks an hour. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Holy crap! For for us to for us to to spend less than a thousand dollars on an offshore trip in our bigger boats is pretty unlikely. Yeah. We typically spend more than a thousand dollars. Yeah. Wow. And so then you got all your other expenses on top of that: your bait, your tackle. Yeah, everything that's Bait, involved. tackle, insurance, uh, in order to fish tournaments around here, and in order to pick up and drop off at most uh, marinas and resorts, you have to have a minimum of a million dollars liability insurance. And that's, that's rather expensive. Yeah. And then there's you know, other expenses that people don't think about, like advertising and, uh, and repairs. Yeah, repairs, golly. Uh, I mean, what? A mobile diesel mechanic in the Florida Keys is a rock star. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Another thing I was curious about, so obviously it's expensive to run these trips. The trips themselves are expensive by most people's standards. Um, here's a question I've always wanted to ask a charter captain. What's the one thing that gets on your nerves on a charter worse than anything else that you can think of? Is there one thing that just jumps in your mind that says, man, I hate it when my clients do this? Well, uh, sometimes we uh, sometimes we have what we call the never real family, and the rods bent, the drag screaming, zzz, 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 and they're yelling, "What should I do? What should I do?" And our our uh, reaction is always real, 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 and they just don't real. Double, 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 fish on, fish on, fish on, fish, fish on, fish on, real, real, real. real. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you just got to reel aggressively on that fish and we also teach them to lift their rod slowly and reel down quickly lift their rod slowly and turn down quick uh, reel down quickly to turn the fish's head yeah. and get them coming towards you it's a hydrodynamics issue <laughs> uh, so we get in their real family I guess another thing that is kind of funny sometimes is you get a fellow all the way out to the humps that tells you a hundred fishing stories on all the fish that he's caught and all the places he's traveled all over the world fishing mm -hmm. and then it gets time to fish and he's holding the rod and reel upside down <laughs> you know, you know it's, it's funny you mentioned that and is one of the things that i've experienced personally you know charter fishing i because i would book charters when i came down here long before i knew you and uh, i won't mention any names in town but uh as a customer on a charter boat, one of the things that always really pissed me off, you know, I'm paying $1,500, $1,800, $2,000, $2,200 dollars a day for this fishing trip just to get yelled at all day long. You know, I've been fishing all my life. I've saltwater fished, I've freshwater fished, and, you know, I kind of think I know my way around a boat, know how to handle gear and that kind of stuff. And I went with this one particular captain, uh, and I basically just got my ass chewed all day long. <laughs> yeah. yeah, some people save uh, all year long or even all their lives just to have an experience down here fishing in the Florida Keys. Yeah. And uh, I've seen a lot of times where rabid captains yeah. ruin that experience for them and I don't want to be that guy. Yeah. But I will say that with the internet nowadays, every day is like a tournament. You want to hold up, you want to have your clients holding up big fish for Facebook and Instagram sure, and sure. all that every day. So uh, when you get a big one on, the intensity, you know, ramps up, a ramps bit. up, and uh, you, and and I get excited and uh, and but I, I I try not to yell at the clients. I try not to yell at my first mates. Uh, because, it, like you said, with your experience with that captain, it just makes a, a, a great experience terrible. And, it can, uh, yeah, it can. I like a little bit easier going feel, you know.
One question I've always had when I've gone charter fishing that always makes me a little bit uncomfortable because I don't really know the expectations is uh, how much do you tip? You know, are there some general expectations? I know there's no rules, and I'm sure it's no different than us eating here today. If our waitress does a great job and takes good care of us, we tip tip well. And but there's you know probably uh, 15, 20 percent you know normally expected if you get reasonable service. How does that work on a charter boat with your uh, your deck hands? And how yeah. do they how do they get paid specifically? Yeah. So. Uh like any profession there's different captains that pay their mates different ways the way anna banana fishing company pays its first mates is they work for tips only tips exclusively and uh, we have signs on our boat that says a customary tip is 20 percent and we explain to people on the phone and the internet that book the charter that we'll have a first mate or two um, that's there to help them and there to make sure everything stays safe. Mm -hmm. And uh, they work just like a cocktail server or a waitress where they get paid 15 to 25% depending on how good the service is and how good the experience is. And mm -hmm. uh, that's, you know, 15 to 25% of the charter fee. Yeah, yeah. So obviously that in incentivizes your deckhands to work harder, to stay on top of what they're doing and, and give the best service they can, at least I would think. <laughs> yeah. You know, the better they do, the more they're gonna make. And yeah. they know that's what they're working for. Um, well, I've always wondered about that because you know, you get on a boat and it's like, well, it's already an expensive trip and then you're adding another, you know, 20%, 15 to 20% to that on top of it for the deckhands, um, you know, adds up after a while and you're like, wow, you know, what should I tip these guys? What's fair and what do they expect? Well, and it's like last night I had a family with me from Indiana that went out on a charter and uh, my first mate was a kid that's been, he was in my kid's fishing camp when he was 14. He's 20 years old now, his name's Chicken Wing. Nice. He got his name because he brought chicken to the camp every, every day and got the name Chicken Wing. But uh, Chicken Wing uh, was in town because his mother passed away three days ago. Oh. Tragic. Yeah. But uh, he called me up and said he was uh, wanting a first mate while he was in town and uh, figured that would be some good therapy for him to get over his mom's yeah. passing. And uh, you know, we got in before dark and we're eating castaways, eating our catch at castaways with the group from Indiana, my wife and I, Anna. and. Uh, I uh, excused myself from the table and said, I'm gonna go check on Chicken Wing, who's cleaning the fish, cleaning the boat, doing everything. And the family was so surprised that here we were an hour and a half, two hours after we had come in, and I'm going to check on Chicken Wing. They were surprised that here it is after dark and Chicken Wing's still there. Yeah. Well, yeah, Chicken Wing's still there scrubbing on the boat. And uh, they just don't realize what goes what a first mate and a captain have to do on the pre-flight setup right during the charter and after the charter so a, an eight hour charter is really a 12 or 14 hour day for us yeah i was about to say you guys probably get up what four or five o'clock in the morning start getting bait ice get the boat ready get the tackle ready yeah. uh, make sure you're fueled up all that kind of stuff then the charter starts and then you got all day offshore, and then you come back in, the deckhands are probably, like you said, they're out there cleaning the fish. I've seen some of the catches you come in with. <laughs> that could take a while. And then, uh, you know, the boat and everything else. And these guys are probably not in bed till 10, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight, whatever it is, I don't know. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's different age captains, like my son being 25, he doesn't use a deckhand as much as I do because he's a lot, healthier and more energetic and you know I'm old fat with a, <laughs> with a bad back and uh, you know I, my first mates have carried me longer than my mother and I'm working like farm animals you know <laughs> like farm animals that's great <laughs> hadn't heard that one yet <laughs> uh, let's see what else did I want to hit on um, all right one thing I've always wanted to know um, and this happened to me on one of my charters. And it happened to me with one of my friends on board. So you've got all this gear on the boat, 
you've spent thousands of dollars on, you've got rods and reels everywhere, and uh, I'm sure it's happened at some point or another, somebody drops an expensive rig over the side. You know, not that, not, not that they're goofing around or anything, but a fish hits, catches them off guard, next thing you know, they don't know how to handle the gear, and bam, in goes your setup. Does that happen? Yeah, so <clears throat> there's, a, there's a captain in town, I won't mention his name, but you know, we are required by the Coast Guard to give a safety orientation when people step on board. Uh -huh. Let them know where the fire extinguisher is and let them know where the life jackets are and the first aid kit and such. But in this captain's orientation, he ends it with, I got 10 rod and reels on board. They're all valued at $500 and I need new rod and reels, so drop as many over as you want, but you'll be paying for them. <laughs> gotcha. That's uh, one way to handle it. <laughs> I think that's a little brass, uh, so I, I don't really talk about that in the orientation or during the charter. Yeah. And I've got some rod and reels that are worth $5,000. Yeah. Um, if one goes over, it's okay, it happens. It's part of doing business. It's just like owning a cab company and somebody T-bones your cab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what kind of boats do you have? Uh, we have six boats in our fleet. We have a, a 53 Hatteras, a 50-foot Bertram, and a 40-foot Hatteras. Um, all priced differently, all do the same but different things. Um, and then we have uh, Reef Boats, which is a 30-foot Boca Grand single-engine diesel. And we have uh, a faster boat that has uh, twin Yamahas on it. That's a 30-foot Grady White. But both of the boats, both of the inshore Reef Boats have padded seats, shade in the front, shade in the back, restrooms, uh, dual stations. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have a, uh, a bully netting slash bait boat because we also do nighttime bully netting charters where you can catch lobster with a net. But oh, that's cool. I hadn't thought about that. We try to have a boat to fit whatever need you have. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, something else that uh, comes up a lot, and I have a lot of people on, you know, on the channel call and ask, obviously, real estate stuff, but they ask me a lot about fishing down here. Um, so, you know, weather's always a factor. Everyday weather's a factor. And uh, so if you get folks on the boat and you got one that gets extremely seasick and you're already 10 miles out, what can somebody expect if that happens? They take their family, mom gets super seasick, and next thing you know, she's miserable. Tell me a little bit about what somebody could expect if they go out on a charter and something like that happens. Well, first of all, nobody, that I know of dies of seasickness. So it's not a, a terminal or imminent issue. Yeah. You're just miserable for a while, right? They're miserable and it is important for the captain and first mate and their their family and friends to make sure that person that's seasick stays hydrated. Yeah. And a lot of times you don't want to stay hydrated because the more you drink, the more you puke. We got a man down? So <laughs> surviving you got any whiskey on you? Any whiskey? No, any whiskey. Is that what you need? I'm, I'm surviving over here. Little Brass little. monkey a little too too tough on you last night? <laughs> Brass monkey was fine. He wasn't even <laughs> drunk when he came up. <laughs> but you have to stay hydrated in that situation. So after we, we make sure that everybody knows to keep the person seasick hydrated, the second issue is to consult with the family or the group on what they want to do. Yeah. If they want to turn around, we can turn around. If they want to keep going, we can keep going. If they want to stay where we are and see how it's going to go for a while, we can. Uh, we're, it, there's options yeah. when that happens. Typically, once we get a mile out, the charter fee is 100%. That's what I was going to ask you next. So I'm a newbie to charter fishing. I don't know how all this goes. We get out there, my brother gets terribly seasick, we decide to go in. I can't expect to get back to the dock. Said, well, Joel, we were only out an hour and a half. I want it prorated. <laughs> well, 
You know, um, it's not just the, it's not that the charter was cut short and our expenses are less and we should be able to prorate it for that. It's that we use that day for a charter that we could have gone out on sure. and gotten paid in full. Right, right. So when we black that day out for the Jones family, yeah. uh, then the Jones family is responsible for that charter fee in full because the Smith family who wanted that day went out with somebody else and paid them in full. Right, kind of like booking a hotel room and can't cancel it just because you got sick five minutes before you got there. That's <laughs> You're right. You're still going to pay for the hotel room. We can't help Mother Nature and we're only going to do what you ask us to do. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, as much yeah. as as much as we try to control things, Mother Nature sometimes has her own thing in mind and we're going to do the best we can, but. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, that brings up another subject that I can think about that to someone new to charter fishing might be a question they might have. So I booked this charter, uh, all day charter with you. We go out, fish like hell all day long. I know you do everything you can, but at the end of the day, come in with a couple snapper that big is all we got for the day. And I know there's days like that. I'm sure there's days that you, know, you might blank, I don't know. Um, do you get a lot of, uh, what's the response from your customers when the fishing is just slow? Do you, and what should somebody expect, you know? Because I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people that book charters, especially coming from out of state, down to the Florida Keys, maybe they don't have a lot of fishing experience. Uh, they don't know how all this goes. They don't realize that we don't catch fish every single day in the Florida Keys. Uh, every time we go out, even though people think that since, you know, this is one of the fishing capital of the world. Um, you know, there's just, there's going to be days where the fishing is just dead slow. What's, uh, what could, what advice could you give to somebody booking a charter about days like that? Well, I'll start out by saying that Anna Banana Fishing Company, uh, for over 20 years, we've had a no fish, no pay policy. People say, well, if I catch a grunt that's big, is that a fish? Yes. Um, but we try to catch the best quantity and the best quality fish that we can on that given day. Sometimes Mother Nature throws us a curveball. In, in over 20 years, we've only had three no fish, no pay policy incidents. One was red tide with a million dead fish floating on the surface in Tampa Bay. You didn't just hook one and pull it up there and say, that counts. <laughs> We did, it was with an attorney and his son and we got back to the dock and uh, he said, how much owe you, Captain? And I said, you, you don't owe us anything. We have a no fish, no pay policy and we didn't catch anything. Wow. And he, he said, well, you worked your tail off and uh, we understand all these dead fish floating on the top of this red tide, so we're gonna pay you anyway. So I got paid anyway on that. That was that. cool of him. Yeah. Another trip uh, was uh, a fella comes to the marina and he says, I noticed that you have a no fish, no pay policy, but I want to catch a shark. Will you do a no shark, no pay policy? And I had had the shark just eating all my game fish off the line, eating the bottom of the boat out. And I thought <laughs> to myself, I normally don't make it species specific, but yeah, I'll do a no shark, no pay policy. Yeah. We went out there for six hours and I could not get a shark to eat. So, and he did hold me up to that and, uh, and I didn't get paid that day and it hurt, it stung. Yeah. But uh, I don't make it species specific anymore. It's yeah, just a no fish, no pay. And then the third time it happened was just something I can't explain. It was a beautiful day. We had beautiful bait. We had beautiful everything and we could not catch a fish. There was, it was like the, the, the perfect storm or something that lined yeah. up, you know, that where we just didn't catch a fish that day and that stung. But other than that, if we have a tough day out there and the people don't feel satisfied, we'll work out a discount on the next trip or take them out maybe the next day to try to make up for it or stuff like that. Yeah. It happens very rarely, but we, we want you to feel we want to, uh, what is it called? We want to over deliver and yeah. under promise. Yeah. And if you don't feel satisfied with our charter, then 
we're going to work with you. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember a day when Joseph took you guys out and the tuna, we were just killing the tuna at the humps. We were limited out with uh, a 10 tuna bag limit in less than an hour, no problem, for many days in a row. And then he takes you guys out, and I think you guys caught three or four little tuna. Yeah. And it's unexplainable. Yeah. You know. Um, and that day it was absolutely dead out there. There was no birds, very few rips, nothing going on. Boats were scattered everywhere. You could tell nobody was catching anything. <laughs> but I know Joseph didn't do anything wrong. You know, there's 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 a lot that goes into fishing with the the temperature, the cloud cover, the position of the sun, the position of the moon, the barometer, the wind, the uh, you know everything. And uh, days like that, maybe there was something that, that we don't know about the barometer that just made fish have lockjaw. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, we we. Our goal every day is to catch the best quantity and best quality fish we can for our clients every day. And, and a, a charter captain's left with the decision, when, when you're anchored at a spot on the reef, for example, and the fishing's not going so good, and you know that it's, it's got the potential of getting a lot better when the tide changes in a half an hour. Do you hang in there and wait for the tide? Do you pick up your anchor and go to somewhere that you know is going to be better uh so should you stay or should you go is a decision that charter yeah. captains have all the time and uh charter captains instinct and how they're dialed in at that particular time helps that decision so that's why i always say you're just overall going to do better with a full-time guide versus a full-time plumber part-time guide yeah. Because we're just dialed in. We know when to hold them. We know when to fold them. We know yeah. when to walk away. We know when to run. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, I was thinking about, you know, again, back to the folks that maybe not have not done many charters in their life, if any at all. You know, when you make that phone call, you call down here, there's hundreds of captains to pick from in the Florida Keys. And you don't know anything about it. How in the world does someone new to this thing, I guess it's, call a bunch of guys and see who's got an open day the day that it works for you. But, you know, one of the things that I would, based on what I know about it now, that I'd recommend to everybody is ask the captain what's biting. Don't have preset in your mind, I see myself landing a sailfish today. Or, you know, all these visions of grandeur that people get, they, they watch the shows on TV and think, oh, we're going to go down to the Florida Keys and troll out there a few miles out, and I'm going to hook up with the, the fish of a lifetime. Sure, it could happen, but it's my experience that I think people should be asking the captains, hey, I want to go out fishing next Tuesday. What are we fishing for? Not, here's what I want to fish for. Is that? Mark, that is, that is one of the most important subjects when it comes to picking a guide and and, and figuring out what you're going to target and all that, you know, there, there's the, a famous outdoor writer named Bob McNally, and he told me when I was a young guy, he said, Joel, the main thing you got to remember is to keep their rods bent and keep their drag screaming. It doesn't matter what kind of fish is on the other end of the line, just have live action. Yeah. Well, and that's true to a certain point, but, you know, sometimes I get guys that come down here and say, I want a tarpon, not just any tarpon, this tarpon needs to be over 150 pounds. And, uh, or, you know, I want a marlin, mm -hmm. or, uh, and maybe. Well, I would expect that someone that would make that request of you also probably is experienced enough since they're targeting a, a, a fish like that. They probably know, hey, this is a crapshoot. We may get this fish or we may not. We may catch a tarpon or we may not. But I would have guessed they'd be experienced enough to target a fish like that to know that, you know, hey, you know, yeah. it, it's not magic. You can't just snap your fingers and get a 150 pound tarpon on. And a lot of times they are experienced and, and they have their bucket list fish and their personal best. And, but you'd be surprised how many people, like you said, you know, watch 50 YouTube videos and they get so fired up that by the time they get down here, 
they know what they want, but they've never even, you know, caught a bass. Yeah. Uh, so it, it is good to ask the captain, what's the best bite? What's biting right now? And it's good for the captain to, to meet their expectations by asking them, are you interested in fish to eat or just fish to fight? Um, are, are you interested in braving the waves and going offshore after big game deep sea fishing? Or are you interested in fishing smooth water at bridges, docks, uh, ledges, wrecks, yeah. backcountry flats, that kind of thing? What, um, but uh, we try to get uh, the captain and the clients on the same page on, on what we're expected to catch. Yeah. I think, I think I would establish that up front as a customer of yours. I'd probably say, hey, Joe, I want to go out and catch a Wahoo today if we can. So we're going to target Wahoo. But if we spend the first four hours strolling for Wahoo and nothing's happening, you look at me and you say, Mark, we ain't going to get a Wahoo today. If we do, it's just sheer luck because the conditions are just not right, whatever the reason is. I'd much rather go spend the last half of my charter anchored up down by the bridge catching snapper, you know. Just yeah. to have something to do, and then and you so, know. And sometimes I, sometimes I have people that say, "Captain, I just want to catch one wahoo. I want, I don't, I want to book an eight-hour charter, and I want to spend the whole eight hours just catch, just targeting wahoo." And I'll say, you know, it's 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 not the time of year. We have a half moon, which is not what wahoo like that much. We have an overcast day, which is not what Wahoo like that much. Um, they're not feeding, but we can go after Wahoo for eight hours. And if we do go after Wahoo for eight hours, my no fish, no pay policy is off. Uh, because you're targeting that one specific fish? That's right. And I also tell them, you know, when I try to convince them, let's not go for Wahoo this particular day, or let's spend three or four hours trying to get a Wahoo and then go for something else. Then my no fish, no pay policy is on. And, and everything else, but uh, you know, if the client wants to pay me to go target giraffes, <laughs> we'll go target giraffes. <laughs> That's funny. You got a license for that, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> You'd ask the question, uh, some of what, what aggravates you the most? And, yeah. Uh, and uh, and not, not that it aggravates me, but there's, you know, we allow alcohol. A lot, of, a lot of people ask, are you allowed to bring alcohol on a charter? Uh -huh. And the answer is yes, the more the merrier. Okay. Uh, we're there to have a good time. Right, right. Um, but uh, it's the guys that uh, start mixing Jack and Coke at seven o'clock in the morning <laughs> when I know it might be an interesting charter. Absolutely. You know, so for safety reasons, it's, it's great to have a beer or five out there, but I, for safety reasons, yeah. I wouldn't get. All right, so tell me your blitz. funniest story of your drunk customer. Oh, I was uh, snook fishing one time uh, in the Tampa Bay Flats, and we had a full moon with the tide ripping. And there's one of those guys that started mixing Jack and Coke at 7 o'clock in the morning. By noon, he could barely stand up. Yeah. Well, we're anchored with a dual power pole system on a flats boat. Uh, near some mangroves with the current ripping past the boat and ripping past the mangroves. This fella hooks into a snook, sets the hook, falls over the side of the boat and gets swept under the boat and did not come up on the other side. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I immediately jumped in, put him in the headlock. I found him under the boat, put him in the headlock and brought him to the other side of the boat and we eventually got into the boat, but he was missing in action for a good, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds. <laughs> there was another time. They scared the hell out of you, didn't they? <laughs> there was another time I was in a shark tournament with a uh, Hall of Fame baseball player, Wade Boggs. Uh -huh. And I know Wade wouldn't mind me telling this story because he told it up on the podium with a microphone in front of him. <laughs> But uh, we were in what's called the Black Tip Shark Shootout, and we were raising money for the National Pediatric Cancer Foundation tournament. And it's a 24-hour tournament. It's an all-release tournament. 
you have to bring your biggest black tip shark, black tips only, into the boat, and you have to video tail gaffing them, which is a lasso that goes around his tail, it doesn't hurt him, brings him into the boat safely. You have to video him going on the tournament measuring device to get an official measurement, and then you have to video the live ethical release of that shark. So we're there about midnight, we're anchored up, we got some chum going over the side of the boat, some blood going over the side of the boat, and uh, all of a sudden one of the shark lines goes off. Wade Boggs reels it in. And halfway into the boat, boom, the shark gets hit and goes limp. Turns out it's about a three, four foot black tip that got cut in half by another shark. And all we had was... was oh, excuse me. That's okay. Sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> all we had was the head and half the body. And uh, so I'm getting the head and the half the body off the hook and getting ready to throw that half a shark back into the ocean. And Wade says, Joel, doesn't it make sense to you that whatever took that tail half of the shark might want the head half of the shark? <laughs> I said, yeah, that does make sense. So I just hooked that head part back out, sent it back out on a hook and a weight, and five minutes later, rod starts going off turns out it's it was the tournament winning black tip shark that ate another black tip shark they're cannibals oh, wow and it turns out that it was the tournament record shark for all the years 15 years that we had been doing the black tip shark shootout for pediatric cancer foundation and uh, it also gave us the most amount of wins uh, for the years in a row for that tournament, uh, which we were very proud of. Not yeah, to, without not, a doubt. Not to beat my own horn, but beat beat. <laughs> anyway, the story is during this fight, Wade Boggs is fighting this shark. We throw our anchor line. We have a ball connected to the anchor line so we can go chase the shark down in the dark. Full moon, three to four foot waves in Tampa Bay, very windy and rough. The shark goes around another captain's anchor line. We have to drive up to the anchor line, take the rod and reel on the bow, unwrap it around his anchor line, and go back and chase the shark. We did that, and I yelled to my crew, guys, everybody hold on. We're going to do a 180 and get back to the shark and get out of here before my boat hits the other boats that are anchored up. So we did a 180, Wade Boggs, right over the side of the boat. Oh, wow. Little did I know, <laughs> Wade Boggs doesn't know how to swim. No kidding. So there's Wade in the water. We finally, we, we, we spot him after five to seven seconds. And uh, he's, uh, he's still got a hold of the rod and reel with an angry shark that's trying to pull him. And he can't swim. And he can't swim. He's doing his best to doggy paddle and keep his head above water, but he's not doing a good job of it. I immediately got the boat right beside him. Uh, I had my first mate grab the wheel. I got to the gunnel. I grabbed Wade under his armpits and I pulled him over the gunnel and he still held on to the rod and reel. Um, and uh, so the story goes on that uh, we got to the shark chased the shark down, shark was worn out. We went to tail gaff him. The tail gaff that's made of a cable, the cable broke on the shark's tail. Now the shark's thrashing his tail around, the cable's hitting the side of the boat. So I make a uh, tail gaff out of some dock line to put around his tail. I reach over the gunnel, put it around the shark's tail. Shark takes off, pulls me over the side, and now Wade has to save me because I'm on top of an angry shark with just a dock length rope away from us. <laughs> so we kind of saved each other's life that, that night. Uh, I think <laughs> Wade was probably in way more danger than I was. Uh, but we ended up getting the shark in and uh, Wade at the award ceremony was up on the podium telling this very story 
wow. and said that uh, he could read in the uh, Tampa Tribune the next morning that uh, Wade Boggs drowns in a shark uh, in, in, in a shark tournament. And uh, I also found out that other than wanting to raise money for the National Pediatric Cancer Foundation, which Wade's been a champion of for decades now, yeah. uh, part of the reason why he wanted to be part of the black tip shark shootout is because he has, a, he's deathly afraid of sharks. And he even uh, starred in a movie called uh, Swamp Shark, uh, which is a sci-fi movie, to try to overcome his fear of sharks. No kidding. So not only could he not swim, but he's terrified of sharks. So I don't know why I told that story, but. It's interesting. It's interesting, <laughs> it's interesting uh, as hell, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that is cool. Wade Boggs, wow. Talk yeah. about a superstar. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Great guy. So if, I, so if I call down here and I book a charter with, with Joel Brandenburg and Anna Banana Charters, or JoJo, whoever, um, got my family in town, I'm renting a house over in Key Colony Beach, and, uh, and I'm going to uh, book a whole day charter with you. Tell me just real quick, what's that day look like, timing-wise? What do I need to bring? What do I not need to bring? All right. I got my favorite fishing rod with me. Do I bring it? Do I not bring it? Well, I'll we talked about drinking on the boat. Yeah. So a lot of times people want to have their adult beverages on the boat and they're worried about if they meet us at our marina and drive there, will they be able to legally drive back to their vacation rental house? So a lot of times people ask us to pick them up at their vacation rental houses, which is actually illegal in this town to charter out of a residential home. Yeah. So we can't do that. Yeah. Um, but if you, do meet us at our marina and you do have alcoholic beverages uh -huh. on the boat during the charter and you're worried about driving home just know that one of the beautiful things about marathon and the florida keys in general is that for six or eight dollars yep. you can take a cab yep uh, native taxi island taxi yeah. there's a bunch of them so not to knock people uh, well when people get a dui in the florida keys it's always shocking and disappointing to me because all it costs you is six or eight dollars to get out of it. Yeah, they'll bring a minivan, pick up the whole family, and you're, you're home five minutes later. Come get your car tomorrow. <laughs> so that's one thing is where to pick up, and we, and we would rather you come to Anna Banana Marina. We have all of our fish cleaning equipment there mm -hmm. uh, to, to clean and bag your fish for you. Mm -hmm. Either bring it back to your vacation rental house or bring it to the restaurant or your resort, wherever you're bring it back to um, we let people know that it's it's a our insurance company will not let us provide food and drinks for you if we could we would just because we're hospitable I'm glad you brought that up I've always I didn't know if you should bring sandwiches or what you know I didn't realize yeah so because um, we're not licensed to offer food and drinks yeah um, make a sandwich somebody gets sick it's your fault Right, so yeah. we, what we provide is a cooler with ice for any food and drinks that you'd like to bring. And you can bring any food and drinks that you'd like. Yeah. And we have plenty of room for it. Um, so we will provide all of your fishing gear, rod and reels, bait, tackle, chum, gaffs, nets, everything needed to uh, have a great day of fishing and harvest the fish of your dreams. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we'll clean and bag your fish, like I said, after the trip's over. And a lot of people ask, uh, how can I get my fish home, like back up to Indiana or back yeah. up to New York? And um, UPS will ship it. They have some shipping requirements. Uh, there's some fish markets in town that mm -hmm. will also ship it. Both those options are very expensive, so bring your wallet with you when you do that. I bet, I bet. Probably the best option if you're flying home and you'd like to bring some meat with you is to get one of those carry-on coolers, either a cooler bag that zips up airtight or a small cooler uh, and you can get dry ice at Publix mm -hmm. and you can have it as your carry-on baggage. Yeah. And uh, they let that go through fine and uh, it doesn't cost you anything. and. Yeah. It just minimize, minimizes the amount of fish you can bring back. 
Right. But there's also an option where if you, if we catch a bunch of fish and you're bringing back 50 or 100 pounds of fish, uh, then you can just buy an igloo cooler, not styrofoam, a hard cooler, mm -hmm. and uh, tape it up and send it through the uh, check through. And it might cost you 30 or 80 or $100 extra, depending on how many bags that you have with the new airline baggage fee yeah. charges. Yeah. But uh, God, it's got to be so much cheaper than shipping it, though. Yeah, got to be. Yeah, for sure. That's that's a, that's a good point. And I see down there at the uh, the UPS store by Publix. It's they got a sign out there that says we will ship your catch anywhere in the U.S. Or I guess anywhere in the world. Probably I don't know. Probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. And then people also ask, can I bring my own rod and reels on board? Sure, we got plenty of room for that. Some people. Uh, especially when it comes to fly fishing, their fly their fly rod is like their golf clubs. It fits their hands. It's their own personal deal, and, yeah. and that's and, and that's fine. And we'll accommodate uh, anglers that want to bring their own rod and reels. But I can almost guarantee you that whatever rod and reel you bring, ours will be more equipped for what we're doing, and probably more expensive and elaborate. Uh, yeah, yeah. What about the calls you get? let's say from a, a family you know husband and wife couple kids something like that they want to go they want to do some light fishing maybe fish at the reef or yellowtail or maybe down by the bridge just catch some fish let the kids experience that and then spend half their day at the sandbar yeah. or go touring or stuff like that do you do stuff like that yep we uh, customize your trip uh whatever your dreams are we're going to try to fulfill your dreams and uh it's especially during lobster season we get a lot of requests for hey, can we do a half day of fishing and a half day of lobster? Or can we do a half day of fishing and a half day of spear fishing? Or can we do a half day of fishing and a half day of just hanging out at the sandbar like you're saying? Some people even come down uh, and uh, they're interested in real estate and they uh, want to spend a half day fishing or lobster or spear fishing. The other half day would be bringing them through residential canals of their choice looking at the backsides of houses that they may be interested in buying or sure. condos. You know any good realtors down here? Yes, uh, <laughs> you need to look up Mark and Lori Gable. Gable's on the go. There you go. You're gonna yeah. plug me somewhere in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's cool, you know, that's how our YouTube channel actually kind of got started big time was um, all the years I spent renting. Uh, especially in the Key Colony Beach area. And I just got on my boat one day and just went out there and put the camera on and started talking about trying to share information that I've learned, what to do, what not to do when you're renting a place down here, you know, just mistakes that I made that I could have saved a lot of money or had a lot better time had I known, but it took me 20 years to you know, figure all that out and get it sorted out. And I made that video and that really kind of launched our uh, our YouTube channel, and that's what launched me into going to get my real estate license and getting into it. The amount of phone calls we got, it was like crazy. And I was like, well, you know, if I can, if I can do it there with the uh, vacation rentals, surely I can learn the real estate market down here and do it there too, and it's worked out. Well, I think you've learned it well. I, I'm fortunate enough to take out a lot of your uh, real estate clients, both clients that are looking for homes and that bought homes from you guys and uh, they rave about uh, what a nice experience it is uh, to uh, be with you guys and and to look at homes with you guys and uh that's so great to hear i've had nothing but uh, customers with five star experiences with you guys that's so. awesome that's, that's so nice to hear for sure captain joel i appreciate you spending this time with me out here at lunch today and uh, answering questions for people quite candidly. I appreciate that. And uh, if you guys are interested in booking a charter fishing trip down here in the Florida Keys, needless to say, I highly recommend my friend Joel. He does a great job. Give Joel a call. Book your trip. Come down here to the Keys. If you want to go look at houses, call me. I'll put all of our information on the screen and in the description below the video. Get in touch with us. We'll help you. Both of us will help you any way we can. So until uh, next time, guys, thanks uh, for watching Gables on the Go. See you later.